Hello and welcome to Across Africa. I'm Georgia Calvin-Smith with our weekly look at stories from across the continent. Coming up in the programme, sold as slaves for a couple of hundred dollars. UN investigators in Libya speak to African migrants who say there is a shameful trade in human lives there. Victims suffer extortion, abuse and are even murders. Also, as Gambia's new government tries to encourage some of the thousands of exiles who fled during the two-decade-long rule of Yahya Jame to return, we meet one who has already done so, an entrepreneur who's come back from the States to take her place in this new phase of her homeland. And around half a century ago, Egypt's Jewish population numbered over 100,000. But today, only a handful remain, less than two dozen. Many struggle to come to terms with the local demise of their culture. But first, the UN has uncovered a disturbing slave trade of migrants in Libya. The International Organization for Migration has taken testimony from Africans who've told of traffickers buying and selling people in car parks for as little as $200. It's a brutal face of the migrant crisis. Martin Pollard has this report. As seen here, some arrests have been made to try to combat the illegal trafficking of migrants. But in the political vacuum that is Libya, smugglers and armed groups still thrive. Now, the International Organization for Migration, or IOM, says it has discovered another horror story to add to the country that it calls the Valley of Tears. Uh, migrants also are being sold and Selling human beings is becoming a trend among smugglers as the smuggling networks in Libya are becoming stronger and stronger. Libya has emerged as the gateway for African migrants who hope to reach Europe. West African migrants interviewed by IOM have told of being captured by armed groups being held, beaten and later being auctioned off in a market-like setting in the southern Libyan city of Sabah. If you go to the market and you can pay between two and five hundred dollars to get a migrant that will work with you uh, on your daily jobs or support your work. Many of them escape, many of them are kept in bondage, and many of them are even prisoned inside uh, an area where they are forced to, to work on a daily basis. Others reportedly find the armed groups try to extort money from them or their families to allow them to continue towards the Libyan coast. Without that, some are abandoned to die in the desert. Many of those that do reach the Libyan coast are then packed on ill-equipped vessels. Far too often, this ends in tragedy. More than 600 are known to have died at sea since the start of the year. Yaya Jame's 22-year rule of Gambia came to an end in January. The new government's now trying to persuade some of the tens of thousands of exiled dissidents to return. One of the first people to do so was entrepreneur Fatou Toure, who set up a small communications firm. She told her story to our correspondents. New offices for a new life. Fatou returned from America a few weeks ago, just as the Gambia's new government came to power. A 30-something, she set up a communications agency. But there have been challenges, not least daily blackouts. Yes. The power is the biggest challenge, the power. You're having a lot of difficulty setting up. That is the main uh, problem. But the others, uh, you know, we, 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 we're getting there. We, we are optimistic because um, it's a new government. Um, the environment has changed. For me, the biggest, um, the greatest thing on, on earth is to come home. Fatou spent just over three years in exile after escaping arrest by agents loyal to ex-president Yahya Jama. Her crime? Failing to testify against a friend. I left it's this kind of taxi, the yellow taxis. So I had a mini skirt on, a top, slippers. It's very, very emotional. I never thought I would go through that, but when you hear the stories of how people escape from the Gambia, you're like, is that really real. She's set up home just outside the capital. She's enjoying life in the new Gambia. Now I feel like, you know, I can do whatever I want. I can talk and say whatever I want. But I'm glad that I'm away from Trump and all his uh, crazy policies. I'm just glad to be home. But Fatou is one of only a trickle of successful exiles to return to the Gambia so far. 
The country has one of the world's highest migration rates per capita. The Twa are often dubbed Rwanda's invisible people, also known as pygmies. Today they live on the fringes of society and often in poverty. Our team sent us this report. It's an age-old custom handed down from generation to generation. Liberata and her daughter are potters, a practice now synonymous with the Twa in Rwanda. Living alongside Hutu and Tutsis, Twa represent less than 1% of the country's population. At 65, Liberata says life here used to be different. At the time, I lived in a forest not far from the river. Then the forest disappeared and we had to resettle in a village. We survived by hunting and gathering. Still, she looks back fondly on the hard days in the forest. Very few Twa own and cultivate land. Most of them make and sell these clay pots. But at 50 Rwandan francs per pot, less than 10 cents, Rwanda's potters barely get by. We hardly earn anything with this. Sometimes we can't sell them all. Sometimes we can't even eat. It's really not a good life. Most potters lack the means to go to school or access health care. Often, they feel isolated from society. Sometimes people are racist. We were reminded we are Twa, and that hurts. Since 2012, just one man represents the Twa at the highest level of the state. Senator Zephyrin Kalimba, an advocate for the community, believes this responsibility should be shared. There is always this inferiority complex that traps them. That's why it's hard for them to integrate into Rwandan society. If they had changed their mindset earlier, they could go to school like the others. They could work and integrate into the national community. But the senator is optimistic. The potters are now recognized as a vulnerable population, opening the door for government support in the hope that this ancestral culture does not entirely disappear from Rwanda. A look now at the handful of Jews that make up their community in Egypt. Population numbers plummeted in the mid-20th century, and now the few that remain struggle to preserve the remnants of their local heritage. In this Cairo synagogue, Magda Harun shows centuries-old Torah scrolls kept inside the Ark a small piece of Egypt's vanishing Jewish heritage. Between 80,000 and 120,000 Jews lived in the country until the mid-20th century. Today, only 18 remain. Our numbers used to be bigger. But because of the old age of our members, at least two or three of them die every year. Magda is president of Cairo's Jewish community, tasked with helping to preserve its heritage. She's one of only six Jews living in the Egyptian capital. At 91 years old, her mother, Marcel, dreads to see centuries of Jewish history fade. It really affects me. And it makes me sad. But there's nothing I can do. It's too late. Many Egyptian Jews left or were forced out following the Arab-Israeli War of 1948. Amir Ramses made a 2013 documentary on the community. Screening the film in Cairo cinemas was a struggle before he eventually obtained clearance. A lot of people still consider that we're in a state of political animosity with Israel, and some still mix the words Jew and Israeli because of that. But I can say that this situation is changing. Little by little, some people are starting to differentiate between Jewish people and those who belong to a state with which there could be a political struggle. Officially, the government makes no distinction between pharaonic, Islamic, Coptic and Jewish heritage. And the Antiquities Minister says he set up a committee in 2016 to list all Jewish monuments. All antiquities have the same importance for us because they all belong to the Egyptian civilization. But some of the country's synagogues, like this one in the coastal city of Alexandria, need restoration. Although Egyptian Jews have been spared recent attacks targeting Christians, many prefer to keep a low profile, hoping to preserve for a little while longer their once flourishing community. Now to Kenya, where there is a big push for developers to prioritize clean energy in new builds. It's one of the countries leading the continent's push towards solar power, which is generally seen 
as being more cost effective than grid sourced electricity. Have a look. It may look like an ordinary estate, yet all 400 houses in this residential community south of Nairobi are equipped with solar panels. Now everyone is making sure that they install a solar system uh, during the time of building. The initiative, which is part of a greater push towards renewable energies in Kenya, has helped cut electricity costs by nearly half. So we're able to have hot water throughout the day, depending on the usage, and also in the night. Experts argue the fast-dropping costs of solar power, combined with plenty of sun and a huge demand for cheap electricity, hold huge economic potential for Kenya. An analysis that hasn't escaped authorities. The country introduced a regulation in 2012 forcing buildings using over 100 liters of water a day to install solar heaters. At Kenya's Climate Innovation Center, there are hopes similar legislation will soon follow. Kenya lying on the equator has some of the best solar insulation uh, in the globe. If the solar energy is well harnessed, it could actually help in stability of our grid. Each of these solar units costs about 800 US dollars to install. A high upfront cost compared to traditional fuels. Yet experts say the technology could pay for itself in the long run. Experimentation with various solar uses is fast expanding in Kenya. Nairobi's Garden City Mall is already equipped with over 3,000 solar panels. The country also plans to invest $150 million this year to bring solar electricity to rural and remote communities. Well, that's it for Across Africa for now. Thanks very much for joining us and do so again if you can. Take care.